It's Jeannie here. Today, I am so honored to be joined by actor and comedian and everyone's favorite uncle, Joey, known from his roles in the iconic TV show, Full House and Fuller House. He's also a hockey player and pop pilot. I even hear a general contractor now, Dave Collier's in the house. Uncle Joey, Dave, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Jeannie. I don't know if I can follow all of that, but uh, <laughs> apparently I'm busy. <laughs> very, very busy, but we're here to talk about something else incredible that's going on. You have a new series on PureFlex called Live and Local. So can you share with us about the series and just kind of how you even got involved with PureFlex? Sure, it's for uh, Sony Affirm, and it's going to be streaming on Pure Flix, which is very faith-based. And so I uh, I got the script, and I saw uh, that it was a real departure for me. I got to wear a nice, big, thick, real beard. My real beard, I got to grow out, and I got to play kind of a very different character than most people uh, are used to seeing me play. So I got to play a little bit of a curmudgeon who is a host on a faith-based radio show uh, on a very small station, but they're number one in the market. So he's a guy who just is not going to change. He doesn't want to do social media. He doesn't really want to break it because he doesn't feel as though it's broken. So um, my character has a lot of flaws, uh, but it's a really interesting show the way we shot it. Um, it's got a little bit of... Um, kind of the office kind of feel to it in that we've got uh you know a lot of handheld camera movements and then we've got uh we've got six static cameras around this radio studio they built a, a full radio studio for us to shoot the show and um you know i i just had a, a wonderful time doing this and uh you know, there, there's a little bit of uh, faith implements in it. You know, we have a lot of faith-based uh, rockers, uh, magicians, right. comedians. I mean, it's, it's all over the spectrum as real guests. So it's a really interesting show. I will tell people it takes, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, a slow starter, but once you get into it, you kind of get hooked. So, uh, so bear with us in that first episode. There's a lot of information we have to get out. But uh, it was a blast and, and uh, Sony Affirm has been great and, and Pure Flix has been great. So we're really looking forward to the premiere July 7th. I know, I, I can't wait. I'm excited to watch it and the whole office-like feel, like, come on, everybody loves that. And, <laughs> and for me, you know, faith obviously <laughs> is a big part of, of me and what I do. Um, is, does that have, do you have a faith dynamic in your own life? I do. You know, I, I always tell people I went to, uh, I went to Catholic schools from grade through three through uh, 12. So I'm really messed up. Um, <laughs> so, so that's my joke that I do, but, you know, I came from a very, uh, a, a big Catholic community here in the city of Detroit. And so, you know, church was kind of, you know, the central focus for our lives, it was really kind of our meeting place and a place where we socialized and it was a place where we, you know, uh, helped those in need and uh, we helped each other. So, so it's always been in my life, you know, in one way or another, but I always say that was kind of like, you know, uh, faith training boot camp for me <laughs> was going through parochial school. <laughs> Yeah, I grew up Catholic as well. Um, and from my experience, it was pretty, you know, ritual, you know, based. And then, you know, later on, I kind of switched to relational more um, with my faith and, and became, I guess, a Christian, you know, full blown. <laughs> um, but that's awesome. I didn't know that about you. Um, I know in the show, interesting enough, it's a fake show, but you guys do real interviews. <laughs> And uh, you mentioned a rocker, Christian rocker. So you had John Cooper on. What was yeah. that like? So what are you? What do you talk to him about in a fake show, but it be a real interview? Like, how? What's that dynamic? We talk to him about what he's up to in his life, you know. And and um, you know, I didn't realize how big of a rock and roller he is. Like like huge. Like like touring with 
you know, huge bands like Metallica and stuff. I mean, like, like huge stuff. And, you know, and his family is such an integral part of his life. His, his wife's in the band with him. Yeah. And so that was really cool. So, you know, he just, uh, I was really impressed with him just, you know, not so much as a, a rock and roller, but as a, a human being, the guy's really, really got it together. And he's got such a, you know, a faith-based family operating system that it was really cool to interview him. Yeah. Yeah. He's an awesome, awesome person for sure. And so are you, um, you know, oh, I, I, serious, <laughs> I've been doing, you know, some research and just checking out your life and just, um, I love how honest you've been with your own journey to sobriety. Um, and I would just love if you can share with us about that because personally I have someone in my family who's struggling with alcohol addiction in particular and it affects everything and everyone and it's a very weighty thing how did you get yourself to the other side you know to be able to realize uh you know maybe sobriety was the better choice well I never thought I struggled with alcohol and that was that was the problem and I grew up in a culture where, uh, you know, we would go out for pizza after our hockey games here and, and the parents would pour us a little beer in a tiny little glass. And we thought, oh, we're so cool. We're just like the parents, you know? So I, I, that was the way I grew up. You know, I was a child of the sixties. I was born in 1959. It was a really different culture. And so I always equated alcohol with having a great time and everybody's laughing and jumping into the pool and we're having pizza parties and you know the the parents are laughing and you know having a great time and so are the kids and and so there wasn't this awareness of the destructive capabilities of alcohol both you know psychological emotional spiritual that wasn't really part of the vernacular back then so in my life it alcohol always equated a good time and so I didn't really realize I had a problem until a few years ago when my wife really started to get worried and you know we would always have a bottle of wine with dinner every night and then it became more than that it became more than, hey, we're just having a great bottle of wine with dinner. It was just, I'm going to open a bottle of wine, you know, for opening a bottle of wine's sake, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't um, something that I ever felt out of control with. Uh, I'm a, I'm a licensed instrument rated pilot. And so I knew I was kind of a smart drunk really is what I was. I would take a few days off before I knew I had to fly so that I could be very aware and, and very crisp and, and uh, clear thinking. And so, so I, I would kind of build my life around those moments of, I need to take it easy so that I can, you know, do what I need to do. Same thing with being a, a television director, same thing with being an actor. I thought, Oh, well, I'm going to have a puffy face so on camera, so I better stop drinking a few days beforehand. So it was very calculated. But when my wife, Melissa, started to really get concerned and telling me, I'm really worried about you, and I'm really worried about the drinking. And then I had a bad fall. Yeah. And I realized after, and I posted the picture to Instagram where my face yes. is all broken up and bloody. And my wife was out of town and my friend said, you better send her that picture before she gets home because that's not going to heal up in two days. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're absolutely right. So I, I sent her the picture and she started crying and she just said, we really need to talk about this. And so even after that happened, it took me another year of, of introspection, uh, looking at my own spirituality and looking at my own life to kind of gauge how this was going to affect my life. I thought, am I still going to be the funny guy? Am I still going to be the final, final, final guy at the party? Am I still going to be the guy who makes everybody laugh? And I thought, 
you know, maybe all these years I've had some liquid courage going, do I really need that? Is it a crutch? And what have I been missing uh, romantically with my wife, spiritually in my life, mm -hmm. psychologically, creatively? And I started to really question all of those things. And so then when I finally decided to get sober, January 1st of 2020, I have never looked back and I never wanted to preach to people. I just wanted to share my story. And if someone can see a little bit of themselves in me and I can help them that way, then that's a real plus. That's a real, that is a, a real check in the, in the positive column for me. That's amazing. Um, thank you for that and for being so honest with your journey. I am, um, you know, it's, it's crazy because you decided to get sober and then, you know, your life takes this crazy, you know, one after the other loss, losses in your life with your brother, then your father, and then uh, the beloved Bob Saget. So how, um, you know, there are people in this season, I think what we can all find common ground is, is the level of loss that we've had after the pandemic. And, just, you know, whether it's a loved one or, or just something grand like that. Um, in your grief journey, how, you know, how was that for you? As well as, you know, having to go through it sober. It was very sobering. It was a wake up call. I realized that I could no longer cover up life's journey of sorrow uh, by applying these layers of alcohol on it. I realized that I really had to feel the rawness of it, the emotion of it. And uh, it kind of started a year ago. My brother took his own life and he had struggled with, um, you know, a, a lot of issues throughout his life. Um, and so uh, his mental health uh, was was something that I didn't think was as deep as it turned out to be for him to take his own life. But for him, every day was such a struggle. And every day was, you know, he would rather not be here than be here. That's how tough it was for him to make that final decision. And I found my brother at my dad's house down the basement. I was the one who found him. And you want to talk about a heart punch. That was a really stiff punch to my heart, to my soul. And believe me, I being sober, I, I felt that more than I ever had because those layers of alcohol weren't there to mask it. And then we went right from my brother passing away and, you know, helping with all of his affairs and, um, to taking care of my dad because my brother was taking care of my dad who was in his nineties. And so we went right from that to taking care of my dad to my dad going into assisted living and, and, you know, being there every day for him at his side, visiting him and making sure he had everything he needed and, 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 you know, using our spirituality to, to, to give to him. And so then um, Bob Saget passed away and you want to talk about another heart punch. It was just so sudden, like my brother. And uh, John Stamos was the one who called me and said, Bob's gone. And I said, what do you mean? I was texting him yesterday during the day. Like, what do you, he said, he's dead. They found him dead in his hotel room. And I just... You know, we all have those moments where it is a defining emotional, spiritual, psychological moment. And that was it for me. That hit me so hard. I hadn't even had time to grieve my brother because I was helping my dad so much. And that really, really hit me. And I just exploded with emotion. Uh, it was just walls of water and, and sorrow. I met Bob when I was 18 years old. That's how far back we, we go. I met Bob when I was a struggling stand-up here in Detroit. 
and uh, we just became instant brothers. So to know someone for 40 plus years like that and suddenly have them ripped away when you're speaking to them the day before, just I couldn't process that. Yeah. You know, Jeannie, it was just it was just not humanly possible that I had the tools to deal with that. But thank goodness, again, I was sober and I was able to deal with it head on and and try to make sense of all of it. I didn't have, you know, it was a full canvas that I was painting on emotionally. It wasn't like, you know, everything was already filled in and I had to just kind of paint this one little section in. It was the full canvas of everything that a human can possibly go through. And then my dad passed away a couple months after Bob. And in between there, we had Norm MacDonald pass away, Louis Anderson pass away, Gilbert Gottfried passes away. Oh, boy. Uh, one of my best friends uh, that I know from Michigan here passes away. Another one passes away. Uh, you know, and I just thought to myself, there was no way I was going to make it through this journey. I wouldn't have been able to feel my own spirituality because I was covering up, covering it up with alcohol. And so Sorry. there was no way that I was going to make it through all of this um, on crutches. I had to, it, it's been like walking on my own two feet emotionally for the past uh, two and a half years. So, like I said, if anybody can share my journey, we all have an incredible loss. We all go through really tough times. It's just, I didn't think mine was all going to happen at once within a condensed year period. But if somebody can see themselves through me and, and the hardship, you know, the, the hardship and, and, and loss, which we all get and relate to that, sometimes it takes that to, to sober us up. Well, it's, it's admirable the way you're able to speak honestly about the raw emotion, you know, and it's almost as God knew that uh, you needed to get sober before, you know, handling all the weight of all that grief. Um, I want to end here. You, there was a photo of you and your TV niece, <laughs> Candace Cameron Bure, that went viral during the whole Bob Saget. Um, uh, you know, memorial and all of that, where it said, love like Jesus, hug like Bob Saget. Um, and uh, we reported on it. it. It blew up. I don't, I don't know what was so, you know, about it, but it kind of, it really blew up. And I want to ask you, we're in crazy times in the world. Um, I mean, we watch the news and I cannot believe this is reality. Um, if we think about that saying, love like Jesus, hug like Bob Saget, can you kind of talk to the importance of having a, a mindset like that in these crazy times? Love like Jesus and hug like Bob Saget. You can't get any simpler than that. That just says it all. It just says love. And I've been talking with friends a lot lately about the state of where we are as a nation, where we are as a world. And I said the other night, I said, you know, I don't care what your politics are. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or you believe in this or you believe in that. We need to get back in this country back to the most important word in the name of our country, which is united. We need to be un the United States of America. Because we're all losing right now with all of this, this hate and divisiveness. We need to really listen to each other. We need to support each other. And we need to be united. And the only way you can do that is with love. Yeah. Dave, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Yes, my social security number, my bank account number. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's been a real journey talking about all this stuff and and um you know you said in the beginning thanks for being so honest with us um i have to be honest with myself first before i can be honest with anybody else and so that's been the journey is like really peeling away all those layers and getting down to okay 
who's Dave? Who am I really? And so thanks for letting me express that. And uh, so lovely to talk with you. Same here. And anytime, and I pray that, uh, you know, on this journey of, of the layers being peeled off, that you just continue to shine brightly in this world. I just had a son, and I think of, um, you know, your character as Uncle Joey and how you always brought so much light to the TV screen with your impersonations and things like that. <laughs> And honestly, I don't see that anymore on TV. There aren't really examples like that. So I'm grateful that I have examples like that so I can be that for my son and for the kids you know, that follow. So thank you so much. Oh, what you do matters. Thank you, congratulations. You know, there aren't many shows like Full House and Fuller House anymore because we tell each other on that show that we love each other. And I think for a lot of kids and parents, it's kind of like, watching our show is kind of like video comfort food it really is it, it gives you a sense of love and a sense of family and a, a sense of togetherness and and uh you know i think that's what we're most proud of uh for full house and fuller house so congratulations thank you and congratulations to you with everything and uh, i hope to talk to you again in the near future <laughs>